Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. We're a teaching center that's dedicated to hands-on courses to improve your skills and knowledge. And today we are going to tackle the ceramic inlay and also we're going to discuss immediate dent and sealing and I'm going to show you the technique that I employ for this important step. So let's take a look at this starting situation. You can't see it here, but I've put some caries on the mesial of the second molar. The first molar is uh, finished. The preparation is good to go. And typically you would have done these both at the same time, but I broke them into two parts. We have plenty of caries on the occlusal, and we also have this caries that extends onto the lingual as well. And as it turns out, that mesial lingual cusp was significantly undermined, which resulted in a little bit of a wider outline form. We're going to start with the 330 burr to get our initial depth and this is a great way to get a depth cut for ceramics. Even though it creates convergent walls it's going to give you the appropriate depth in the center of your restoration so your restoration is not too thin. Don't focus on the walls so much and how tall they are when you're finished with your preparation but focus more on the initial depth cut and then make everything the same depth of that pulpal that you've established initially with the 330 burr. There's a lot of carries here, so this is going to extend quite a bit more. Uh, and you're going to see that the mesolingual cusp particularly is, is quite a bit undermined. So I'm just continuing with the 330 burr. And we're going all the way out to the mesial because we know we're going to be dropping a box because of carries in that location. But typically what you would do is prepare both these teeth at the same time and you wouldn't really worry about uh, one box being dropped separate from another. You could kind of drop them both at the same time. So once you get the outline form wide enough, you can go ahead and convert into the carrier's removal process. So I've speeded up this next section here just to get us to the point where we have a preparation design that lays the framework for the removal of the caries and we try to expand the outline past the caries. We have a lot of decay still remaining on the pulpal and a little bit here on the lingual and a significant amount on the mesial and underneath that mesial lingual cusp. You can see the caries down there. So let's go ahead and drop the proximal box first and we're going to use a 245 for this purpose. And much in the same way if we were doing an amalgam or something, we're not really worried about the divergency of the buckle in lingual walls at this point. We're merely focusing on getting the contact broken, if there was a contact, and getting to the point where we're deep enough into dentin that we can start to divert our attention to carries removal with round burrs and slow speeds. You can see that mesial lesion is pretty significant. But don't focus on the lesion, focus on the outline form. And this is one of the key techniques that we want to follow with all of our disassembly procedures. Once we know that we are in dentin and we have caries, we turn our attention to the round burrs. And these are going to be used in slow speed. The two round, the four round, or the eight round. And of course you can always use a one round, a three round, a six round. Uh, we have round burrs in just about every number from one eighth round all the way up to ten round in dentistry. So you can use uh, all different types of shapes. But typically I try to use the largest burr that I can comfortably fit into the outline form without hitting the adjacent walls. So here I'm just using the two round burr. But as I try to remove the caries in the distal portion, uh, I would like to use a larger burr if I can, if it'll fit. But we can start here with the two round burr and get a feel for how deep that caries is going. But I really think that a four round burr would be a better choice. So once again, moving into a larger round burr, we always remember, try to think large when we're doing caries removal so that we don't have a pinpoint type of a bird that would go into the pulp, for example, and 
uh, get an exposure for us. So the bigger they are, the more conservative they are in many respects because it takes a lot more force to push them too deep. Wow, look at the amount of caries underneath the mesolingual. I have no one to blame here because I put the caries in this tooth. I just didn't remember how far I went with the caries. <laughs> so this all artificially generated as we've done in the past with our turmeric, cayenne, and flobal composite recipe. It's kind of fun to do though. You can see here that we have uh, opened this up quite a bit. And I would say that at this point, if you wanted to do a direct composite, you could. It would be incredibly great. It would be a nice choice to do. Uh, We've shown that in other videos, but today we're going to just show you how to do an inlay. Why would you do an inlay here? Well, maybe you can't get good access to this to do a good composite. Maybe we'd rather rely on the laboratory. And as we've done in the past, we're using a resin modified glass ionomer. Now, I know some of you like using flowable composite for this particular step, but you're going to have to go ahead and etch and prime the tooth before you place the flowable. With glass ionomer, you, the only treatment that you could ever do, that you'd ever need to do, would be to use a polycarboxylic acid or polyalkanoic acid to uh, remove the smear layer. So I've gone ahead and placed adequate amount of the liner in this case. It's not really a base, it's more of a liner. And we like cure that for 20 seconds. So at this point, we're now ready to turn our attention to refining the preparation, and we're going to use the 847KR016. It's got a flat end with slightly rounded corners. The 847 without the KR designation has sharper edge at the base of it. So I like the 847KR. It's really made for ceramic preparations. And what we do here is we let the burr help to create the taper, but we also are going to tip the burr as necessary to get, to get adequate uh, taper throughout the preparation. We really are not looking to deepen the pulp of wall. We've already established that with the 330 burr in the middle of the preparation and we're just simply trying to get all of the margins on clean, strong tooth structure. We're also going to need to widen the box so that we can establish a nice interproximal contour because as you remember in the previous video, we had a diastema between the second molar and first molar that we're going to correct with the two restorations. So we don't want to have that box too small. We want to have it match the size of the box on the distal of the first molar. It's a little shallow here axially. I think we need just a little bit more depth axially. But you can see that whenever you can see the walls all the way down to the pulp wall, all the way around, you know you've got adequate draw or adequate taper. It's also adequate occlusal divergence in the case of an inlay. Now we're going to use the finishing version of the 847 in KR, which is called the 8847, or we're going to use the 8881. And the 8881 is a parallel diamond. It does not have any taper to it, so you have to tip this and follow the walls. And that's not really a problem. If you want to have a burr that has a slightly more rounded tip to it that is going to soften those internal line angles and make it a little bit more rounded internally, this I think is one of the better burrs for that purpose. But remember to really almost exaggerate the draw so that you get a good amount of taper to these walls. A nice easy taper is going to make it so much easier for the technician to wax up this case. Uh, even if it's being milled out of wax and pressed or if it's being milled directly from a block in a milling chamber, uh, the more draw you have it just makes it easier for everything to fit more passively and uh, fit better. And we're just using the, the tip of the burr here in slow speed again to smooth off the pulpal. And this is the 8847KR016. You can even use the burr parallel to the horizon this way to define the internal features of that little lingual box you have there. So after using the burr a little bit on the distal wall of the mesolingual, I think we're essentially done with the preparation at this point. And it's key to have good draw, good bulk, so that the ceramic will be 
strong at those marginal areas and you should be able to see all the walls quite easily at the same time. Take a moment to extrapolate the inclination of the final restoration down towards the center and make sure that from the tip you're explored to the pulpal you have 1.5 millimeters. So let's take a look at immediate dent and sealing and I do want to give a brief lecture on, on this and you know for ceramic restoration should we bond the tooth the day it is prepped and I think that you have four choices you can either immediately seal it you can delay it after the impression you can do it before you cement the restoration or you can do it simultaneously when you seed the restoration there's really four different choices and each one of those choices has advantages and disadvantages but I think if I looked at the top row I think I would find that I have the best combination of features and that would be IDS. IDS has been proven over and over again thanks to Pascal Magne up to five times more bond strengths, minimized post-operative sensitivity and we really have found this technique to be incredibly predictable. The, the bond strengths if you can compare delayed dent and sealing on the left to uh, immediate dent and sealing on the right isn't that amazing? 58.25 megapascals compared to 11.58 in the delayed dent and sealing. One of the provisos is that you do want to remove the air inhibited layer and I'm going to show you how to do that when you're using polyvinyl materials. If you're using polyether, doing that will cause the ether material to stick, so you have to be careful. So all of these preparations have been done with uh, IDS procedure and it's very easy to do. So let's tell you, tell you how. So the first thing you want to do is, um, while we still have the rubber dam on and your, your dentin is fresh and uncontaminated, it's really critical, go ahead and use the bonding technique that uh, you prefer. I prefer total etch, fourth generation style. Uh, the other technique would be self-etch, but it would be sixth generation, not a one-step process, but a two-step process. Those have been shown over and over again to be the champions of bond strengths. So one of those two techniques. So I've, I've left it moist, as we do with our wet bonding technique, and now we're using a um, volatile primer in a two-step system on both of the preparations at this time. And, it, you know, you can try to keep it only to the dentin, but it really doesn't matter because we're going to clean up the enamel anyway. So I usually just go ahead and paint it liberally over the entire surface and really let it soak in. It usually takes about 20 or 30 seconds of scrubbing to get the primer thoroughly, you know, incorporated into the dentin. And then we blow it thin and then we go on to the filled adhesive, not the unfilled adhesive. It has to be a filled adhesive. Otherwise, the recommendation is that you place a flowable composite on top of your unfilled adhesive so that you have adequate strength to that seal. So this filled adhesive is going to provide us with a very robust dentin seal during now and the time when we go to cement the restorations. The next recommended technique is to cover the surface of the adhesive with a glycerin product and I'm just using this in a little syringe I use and cover it and then go ahead and light cure through the glycerin. This will help to minimize the air inhibited layer which has been known to interfere with impression materials. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to light cure these through the glycerin product so it's adequately cured. We'll rinse off the glycerin and then we will take our diamond burr and we will reestablish all of our enamel margins. We'll remove the adhesive that had been uh, slopped onto that area and uh, get back to a clean finish line. So the, the sealed area is just the dentin and this is a very critical step so that you avoid having irregular finish line areas because of excess of adhesive that wrapped over onto the margin area. So it doesn't take much time and this is all done still with the rubber dam on. We are still essentially in the preparation mode at this point and we're getting ready for the impression. But we're not quite done because now we're going to use a very gentle flower pumice to profi the surface and remove any residual air inhibited layer 
before we're ready to go with our impression. So at this point, the dentin is sealed, the enamel margins are clean, and we're ready to take the final impression. So I've added a additional part to this series, and that's going to be the impression and timberization stage. And I think that's really going to be very helpful. So I'll call that impression plus. And the preparations are completed. I think they came out okay. Uh, I think that my technician will be pretty happy with these. And I really look forward to the next video. Hope you guys have a wonderful day.